Thank you. That was a lot for us, uh, which was encouraging, a lot to put into practice, a lot to listen to. Uh, thank you again, Brother Bob, for giving us um, such a good time to especially understand what worship is about and uh, understanding what the Bible talks about worship. So we'll open up for questions and answers. And the way it will work is you can type it in the chat box to one of the admins. And as you send your questions, we'll answer them. <laughs> or we'll try. We'll uh, try. Mario, I'm, going to, I'm going to put a PDF of my notes okay. in the chat. Okay, while we wait for questions, maybe I can ask you some questions, which might help Absolutely. others. So one of the questions I think is how can pastors encourage church members or even themselves uh, be more equipped with songwriting and music and uh, how they can equip or encourage members who want to learn more about that? In the musical aspects? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in, in this age of uh, internet connectivity, um, we have a lot of resources available to us, but I would begin, I, I think, uh, with just the theology of music. You know, why, why did God give us music? And I went through some of those reasons earlier. Um, I don't know if everybody is on, but God gave us music one, because he sings Zephaniah three seventeen. He sings over us. Jesus sang hymns with his disciples. The Holy mm -hmm. spirit is there when we sing Ephesians five. Um, but also because singing is a, an emotional language and it, it helps us feel the truth, helps us feel the, 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 the truth we're singing about. Um, it's different when I say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me it's different because music has has an emotional element to it um we sing so we can remember words we we sing so that we can express our unity in christ and one thing i didn't mention was that we sing as a foretaste of that the new heavens the new earth when we are gathered around the one who's on sits on the throne and the lamb and we are proclaiming worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive worship and honor and power and might and glory and blessing and we are doing that together when we gather as a church to sing that is a foretaste at that time so i teach in the theology of singing and then i would just go to youtube i would just start looking you'll find an instrument and and get trained start start working on things like scales and chords and uh, start. Re, re, um, I wouldn't just watch worship services um, unless they're ones that you want to model yourself after, mm. uh, because a lot of what's on YouTube isn't necessarily helpful. You know, when people are like this the whole time, you know, it's just kind of a mystical experience. And that's not what we're doing. We're teaching and admonishing one another. It's not that it's wrong to ever mm. close your eyes, but that that's not the normal posture when we come together. It's that we are we're singing to one another. Praise God for all he's done. So that that's how I get someone uh, started. And of course, if you have musicians in your church, I would encourage the more experienced musicians to train the more inexperienced musicians. Encourage them to get together. Talk about it. Have times when you can just play and and uh, not necessarily try them out on a Sunday, but but get them playing outside of Sunday. And then, you know, when they're ready, bring them on. Thank you. So the one of the other questions that someone asked is, how do you use electronic effects like harmonies and uh, auto tunes in worship? Uh, well, I'll say I'll answer that with two two in two ways one is what i actually use and one is what i would recommend people use this is how much i actually use zero um and i mean obviously we use a sound system and we like our guitars in tune we use a tuner uh but i god wants to hear the the praise of our hearts the expression mm -hmm. of our hearts and it doesn't have to be 
it doesn't have to sound a certain way. Now, the congregation hears it. And if what I'm doing would be unedifying, mm-hmm. uh, so mm-hmm. someone could say, well, I sing out of tune, so I'll put auto-tune on my voice. I'd say, you shouldn't even be up there singing. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you can't sing in tune, you could lead the congregation singing, but just don't put yourself on a mic. Um, if you're going to put yourself on a mic, you should, it shouldn't be distracting. Uh, so, yeah, har- harmonic. Uh, I mean, guitarists use certain effects and stuff to, to change their sound. That's, that's fine. You know, uh, I just use a keyboard sound. I try to keep it very simple. I don't mind if people use, uh, you know, effects on their guitar, um, that kind of thing. Here's the point. It just cannot become the main thing. And you have like Facebook groups and, you know, websites devoted now to the technology of, of the music that we're using for our Sunday gatherings. That's really dangerous because what it can become is, Hey, we've got, we're doing this, right. We're doing the most important thing. If you're going to do it right, you have to have the very best of the best of the best. No, the fact that something exists doesn't mean that you have to use it. You know, that goes with projection uh, software. You know, I, I was in a place recently where uh, they had all these moving um, pictures behind the words as, the, as we were singing. And I said, why do we do that? And they, they said, well, we just got an upgrade for ProPresenter. And that's part of the package is these moving, <laughs> moving screens behind the lyrics. I said, just because something is there doesn't mean you have to use it. Uh, so, yeah, we, we want to we always be directing people to God's greatness in Jesus Christ through his word and through his spirit. Um, and let that be our focus and only use technology as it serves those ends. I've done that in the past, things moving in the background of the lyrics. <laughs> I don't get it. How is this helping me understand these words better? You know, either it's abstract and it's just distracting or they I've seen like, you know, shots of a a coast, you know, and I start thinking about my vacation and then I think, no, I don't want to. Yeah. Another brother is asking us uh, how you can, if you're a pastor and if you do not learn new songs, how is it important for you to learn new songs in order to teach your congregation how to worship with songs? That is a great question. You don't have to be the one who finds all the new songs. Um, I used to listen to a lot more new songs than I do now. Um, and, and here's why. Let, let me say this part first. Um, we only sing about five songs every week. That's 250 songs a year we repeat at least half of those. That's 125 songs a year. That's not very many songs. And of course we do some of those three and four times. So we probably only sing about 80, 90 songs a year. I think I figured out one time and we did 106 in one year. That's not very many songs. So I can't constantly be introducing new songs to my church. But if you've been a part of this, and you thought, man, I need to introduce some new songs to my church. You might... Um, get some, someone else to look for you, express to them, this is what we're looking for in a song. We want songs that people, three elements for songs that you, that your church should be singing songs. They can sing songs. They want to sing and songs. They should sing songs. They can sing, meaning they're not songs with a lot of strange jumps that have this massive range or they have a lot of syncopation that no one can pick up on. Songs that people can sing. Songs that people want to sing. Songs that are accessible. Songs that, that make sense. Songs that have a beautiful melody. Uh, songs that people want to sing. They, they, they hear it and they go, oh, I'd like to sing it again. Thirdly, songs that people should sing. That has to do with the lyrical content. And that's saying that the words that you're singing matter. And when there's repetition, it's good repetition. It makes sense. The Psalms have a lot of repetition. Repetition isn't bad, but in a lot of modern songs, it's just repeating phrases over and over and over and over. And that's, that's not helpful. Um, so you uh, get, 
you get songs that people want to, you know, so you explain the parameters to someone and say, find me these kinds of songs. And then maybe, you know, once a month they, they bring, Hey, I found these three songs that uh, I think the church might be helped by. That's, that's totally fine. You don't have to do it yourself. If you do do it yourself, I mean, I would recommend obviously us, Sovereign Grace Music. Um, we had a new song come out today called God is Faithful. Uh, that I wrote with a girl named Lacey Hudson. You can find it on all the all the likely places. It's from our Psalms album. It's coming out next month. Um, Psalms Unchanging God, Volume 2. You can look at the Gettys, Keith and Kristen Getty. You can look at, um, uh, they contain Matt Boswell, Matt Papa, Matt Merker, my son Jordan Coughlin. They all write songs. Stuart Townend has written great songs. Um, City of Light has some great songs. Uh, and then other places, I mean, we do one Hillsong song. I was quoting it earlier, uh, man of sorrows. What a name by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God have been on Jesus laid. That's just a great song. Um, but we don't do any other Hillsong songs. Um, not that there aren't a couple I wouldn't do, but, um, yeah. So those are some of the places I would go. Occasionally you'll find a song that someone else does. You go, Oh, that's a good song. But like I said, there's a limited number of songs we can teach. So don't feel under pressure to like <gasps> change everything. Uh, another question is how do you, how does a church train new members for congregational worship? Uh, a lot of that is a great question. A lot of that is by the example of your church. Um, in other words, we planned this church 10 years ago and we realized about a year or two in that people weren't very engaged and people weren't very expressive and we wanted them to be both. So CJ, our, my senior pastor, CJ Mahaney taught uh, two Sundays on Psalm 100, which uh, begins, you know, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth come into his presence with singing, uh, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. So he just talked about how this is the model that scripture gives us of how we're to, to come together into God's presence. Uh, and then we followed up with that, just talking to the people, reminding them of, of how scripture itself tells us we're to respond to God. Over time, the culture began to change. We gave people permission to sing loud. We directed our attention to what these words actually said. We gave them permission to be expressive. We, uh, we, we encouraged it. We talked about how uh, we sing with our whole being, not just part of our being, um, those kinds of things. And over time, a culture developed where if you come into our meeting now, this Sunday, you would say, wow, these people are really engaged and really expressive. So that's the first thing, culture. Um, teach it. Teach it from the front. You can make it part of, I don't know if you have a new members class. We have a new members class that people go through four weeks. Teach it in that. Uh, you could do a Bible study. That's why I wrote the book, True Worshippers. It's for people in the congregation to understand why we sing, why we live, what worship is. Matt Merker has a, song, has a book called Corporate Worship, which is also very good. Uh, um, the it's Gettys available have in India. Sing. Sorry? That book's available in India. Great. The one Matt Merker wrote. Matt Merker, Corporate Worship. Uh, the Gettys is good. I don't think it's as good as Matt's, but it's called Sing. Um, that can teach us as well. So you could do small group Bible studies, uh, or you could do, say, you could give it to someone as an individual. So those are some of the ways we can help people. But I think the biggest is the culture. People who are surrounded by people who are responding a certain way, you go, wow, I want to do this. Yes. Uh, someone asked if, I think it's uh, connected to what you spoke about, you don't need to be equipped musically if you're leading worship because there are other things you can do. So he's asking if they don't know how to sing, should he stay away from the mic or should he be singing while in worship? If you don't know how to sing and really don't know how to sing, I would stay away from the mic to sing. I would use the mic when I spoke. And I lead a, like we have a pastor's college here in Sovereign Grace and um, Wednesday mornings, I spend time with the guys and we 
uh, I have everybody leads at one time. We, we go through the whole class and use everybody leads twice. Some of the guys have been absolutely tone deaf. Meaning if I said, sing this, in Christ alone, my hope is found. They sing, in Christ alone, my hope is found. I think, okay, you are tone deaf. You are officially tone deaf. And, but you're going to lead anyway. So what they do is they have someone else, you know, lead the singing, but they encourage us with what they say in between the songs. And they can shout out things like, no guilt in life, as you know, before we sing it. Um, so yeah, you can still lead, but don't sing on the mic. Um, one of the other questions is, are there any musical styles that are not permissible or might be dangerous if we use them in our services? Oh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, part of that is cultural. Mm -hmm. So uh, cultural connections. So we had a song called The Stripper in America, um, which went like this. Pull my piano around, you can't see it. You can still see me. Now, if you put Christian words to that, Jesus Christ, he is the Lord. Jesus Christ, it's him we adore. It, it, it wouldn't work because everybody's connecting it to this stripper song. So that's one kind of song that would be really unhelpful. But I sense the question was uh, directed towards the, the music itself rather than connections. Um, in making those decisions, it's hard to say this is wrong. Uh, I, could, I could throw out some things like that. Rap is unhelpful because your congregation really can't sing along with that. So they're meant to sing along, and that's, that's very difficult to sing along with. Um, music that overpowers the lyrics. So death metal, you know, heavy metal. Um, we praise you, oh God! You have the You know, where the, you know, the guitars are, like, massive and... <coughs> sorry. Uh, that would be unhelpful. And, and I think the... the uh, motives of the people there would be more to say, hey, we can, we can do whatever we want. We're free in Christ. Yes, you're free in Christ, but everything needs to be edifying. Everything needs to build up the church. First Corinthians 14, Paul says five times, seven times, actually, he refers to being edified, building up the church. What builds up the church? So those are pastoral questions, aren't they? If they're full, um, I don't know the Indian music very well at all, but if there are folk styles that are more related to you know, idolatry or um, sensuality, it, it probably wouldn't be wise to use those musical settings for songs men, intended for corporate worship. But the reality is, I mean, it's, it's good to remember, or good to know that some of the Psalms are built on pagan formats um, not the music necessarily, but in terms of the, the, the lyrical structure, they are very similar to some pagan, uh, pagan examples. Now, you could say, well, which came first, the pagan example or the Christian example? We don't know, but the reality is that there is that connection. So you, I don't think you can unequivocally say, you know, never uh, to an instrument or um, a style, you, you do have to ask the question, is this edifying? And that rules out quite a bit. Yeah, I think that's helpful to ask if, it, if it's edifying and also uh, is singing the focus or the music the focus. That's helpful. Yeah, yes. it, it really is the congregational voice. If that remains your priority, your instrumental questions will be easier to answer. Yeah. Uh, there's another question that the brother is asking, how do I know if the lyrics are making a change in the lives of the people every week? And how do I see this? That's a great question. Uh, by first, by making sure that that's your aim, that you are purposefully doing that. 
Uh, but then just hearing people talk afterwards. So I hear it both in um, the comments immediately after the meeting and over the long haul. So people have said things to me like, I, I came here, this is my first Sunday, I cried through the whole meeting. I, I was so affected by what Jesus has done for me. Or someone's come and said, I never, you knew you could sing so much about Jesus and who he is. And, and uh, I've just been so helped by that. I've been so encouraged every Sunday. I look forward to, to being reminded of, of how Jesus has saved me and how he's working in my life through his spirit. And it just brings me such joy. And thank you for the songs we sing. Those kind of comments. That's how you usually can tell, okay, people are getting it. And then you could ask. Just ask people, you know, what's the effect of the singing? I think for a lot of us, we have to train our people to be more affected by the truth than the music. You know, we might start changing the music and uh, start changing the lyrics to what we're saying. And um, people might not even get it. Mm. They might they might miss it because they're not focusing on the lyrics. They're focusing on the music. Uh, so we, we have... I would imagine that some of us, the, a response to what I'm sharing here is going to be, oh, we got to teach our church. You know, I got to study this. I mean, I talk about this stuff in, in my books. Um, th there's another book, Engaging with God. That's a rather deep one. Matt's book is really good, Corporate Worship. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really good one. Also, I think um, the music and the, 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 the lyrics that you're singing, I think it would also be changing you as a leader first. Uh, even as it's going to work in the hearts of the people that you are trying to reach out to as well. Well said. We are not simply passing on information. We are proclaiming what we ourselves have experienced. Listen to what David says in Psalm 40. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips as you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have not spoken of your, I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. This and this, as for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Why was he so passionate about proclaiming the Lord's deliverance and faithfulness and salvation? Because he had experienced the Lord's unrestrained love towards him. That's in Psalm 40. I'd encourage you meditating on that. It's been a great encouragement in my own life. Thank you. Someone's asking, what's the difference between singing and preaching? I think they're asking that in connection to you talking about how singing and uh, songs as well teaches. So what's the difference between that and preaching? Yeah. They're very similar in the sense that they're both seeking to exalt God's glory in Christ in our minds, our hearts, and our wills. Preaching focuses more on the mind aspect. Singing would tend to focus more or be balanced, heavy, more balanced towards the more weighted towards the effective aspect. So uh, preaching is more system. There are a number of differences. Preaching is more systematic. Songs aren't systematic theology. Songs are expressions of the heart in a word-governed context. So our songs are governed by Scripture. They're fueled by Scripture. Scripture tells us what we can say, what we can sing, but it's not necessarily in an orderly fashion. We want our songs to be clear, but you, when you read the Psalms, you realize they're just taking like portions of Israel's history sometimes and singing about it, or a, a particular example in someone's life. And you don't have the big picture, uh, you know, um, Psalm 23. I was just re remembering that this morning, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's just about the Lord's kindness and mercy and just the Lord being our shepherd. Doesn't tell us that Jesus died for us. Of course, none of the Psalms say that directly. Um, it doesn't tell us that God is, uh, you know, pours out his wrath on our sins, doesn't acknowledge our sin. So it's not systematic theology. It doesn't contain everything that it could say. Whereas when you're preaching, 
you better be sure to say exactly what that text says and to link it in some way to the person work of Christ, because it is, it is linked to that. And, uh, you know, obviously in preaching, you use more words. Uh, the words in songs are, are very carefully chosen. I mean, the words in preaching should be as well, but you have a limited number. Um, and they're meant to kind of repeat something like with a chorus or the fact that it can be repeated. I mean, that's the nature of songs, that they can be repeated. You don't repeat sermons unless you listen to it again. But in general, we don't go around, just get a transcript of the sermon and just read it again. But we do that with songs. So those are some of the ways they're different. They're meant to work together. Uh, because uh, preaching is more of an intellectual activity, that doesn't mean that affections aren't to be targeted. And because singing is more of an effective uh, medium, it doesn't mean that the mind isn't to be targeted. And for both of them, they're meant to result in a changed life, a changed perspective, changed desires. Um, another question is on service planning, how do we choose, is there a hard and fast rule between singing? What do you think about contemporary songs like Sovereign Grace, His City Light, Getty's, and older hymns? How do you draw a balance between them? Is there a hard and fast rule between choosing these songs? Uh, especially yeah. if the older songs uh, may not be con connecting to the main theme of the sermon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are no hard and fast rules based on when a song was written. Uh, the Bible says, sing a new song to the Lord, which is a, which it could be either a new song, a new expression, or a, a new response to a new act of God or a new recollection of an act of God. Um. <laughs> Let me talk about just the way we, we shape our songs. Many people use the songs to point to the sermon. I would encourage you to use your songs to point to the gospel. And here's why. We, we build our songs somewhat, as I mentioned, on the sermon from last week. We do that. I begin with call to worship. Um, it was based on the sermon from last week. So if the song was on the, you know, God saving uh, people, if that was the emphasis, I might start with you know, Isaiah, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. Turn to me, for I'm God, and there's, there's no one else. Then the songs, will, I'll walk through the gospel. I'll walk through God's greatness. I'll walk through our, our sinfulness, uh, the fact that God has provided a Savior in Jesus, and that we now respond in these different ways. That, more than anything, prepares people to hear the Word of God, because they've recognized that they've been brought near to God out of his love for them, out of his great mercy, and now they can live for his glory. And the sermon will tell us something about how to do that. So when you try and build the songs around the, the message that's going to be preached, sometimes it works great. Sometimes you forget the gospel in doing that. Sometimes you sing three or four songs that just say the same thing. So there's no sense of a progression and, and people are geared to respond to stories. So when we, there's a progression, uh, they, they're brought into a story that's greater than their own. It's not just repeating a fact. We're going to talk about God's sovereignty. Okay, here's a song about God's sovereignty. Here's another one about God's sovereignty. Here's another one about God's sovereignty. Here's another one about God's sovereignty. Why? You know, what, what purpose is that? What is that for? What difference does it make? Well, the gospel sheds light on all those things. And you can talk about God's sovereignty in the context of singing and talking about the gospel, but the gospel is the most important thing. And so I want to make sure people are getting that every week. And then sometimes people make the wrong points before the sermon. You know, they may be emphasizing something that the, the preacher isn't even going to emphasize. So there can be problems with that. Um, so I just want to encourage you to think about how to construct your songs in such a way that, that they tell the story of the gospel again. I'm getting some questions here if you run out of questions. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of questions here. Uh, is, are they well, coming directly to you? Yeah, it may be helpful to send them to you first. That, that way, they'll, I'll know they're going through you. Mm. So I encourage those of you who sent me direct questions to send them to Mario via the chat. 
uh, a brother is asking, what do you think about using harmonies in a song? He's not talking about the instruments, but singing harmony during yeah, worship. Yes, yes. Great opportunity for me to highlight another resource. Uh, I do a podcast with David Zimmer, who's here in the church with me. David plays drums in a lot of our songs. He also sings. He's a songwriter. Um, the, sound, the, the podcast is called Sound Plus Doctrine, and we just did an episode on that topic. Uh, how, arranging vocals for Sunday morning. But if, if you, wherever you get your podcast, or you can watch it on YouTube, the Sovereign Grace Music Channel, um, Sound Plus Doctrine. Basically, let me say this, or simply let me say this, um, harmonies are not commanded in Scripture. They can be helpful for making a song, making a lyric stand out, or making a song beautiful. But often in churches, they are overused because the members of the congregation only ever hear harmony, and they never really get what the melody is. So I think it's important that we help the church understand what the melody is, and we give those who would sing harmony direction on when they should sing and when they shouldn't sing. In my church, I will tell our singers, don't sing harmony on the first verse, on the chorus, or the second verse. You can start to sing harmony on the second chorus. Or if it's a hymn, I might say, sing harmony on the third verse. Now, if it's a really familiar hymn, I might say, yeah, let's sing it on the second verse. So familiarity has, has, plays a part in it. But in general, I would use harmony to, to emphasize, to accent like a chorus or you know, a part of a song that you want to stand out. And often at the end of a chorus where we're singing harmonies, I'll have this vocalist come back to unison because that tends to make that line stand out. But you can listen to the podcast. We talk a lot more about it. Um, th there's a link to the book uh, that Jonathan has put. So if you're looking for the book that Matt Mocker wrote, it's there in the link in the chat session. Uh, someone else is asking about. I think we've spoken about this Bob before, uh, but translating songs in Indian languages. Uh, yes. What do you think about translating Sovereign Grace songs in Indian languages? I think. It is an amazing idea. I'm going to put, uh, putting this, I think this will go in the chat. Um, yes, I just sent that to everyone. Um, I think it's amazing. Um, I think I just sent the, the uh, outline of the message to everyone in the chat. Okay. Um, we have a, a place, well, well, for one, our prayer is that people write songs in their own language. The language that our songs have been translated into the most is Spanish. We've done uh, four Spanish albums. We're just about to release a fifth one. Um, we want them to, we want songs written by those who speak Spanish to write them in their, their own language. Uh, we think that'll, that will best communicate uh, in the heart language of that culture. But in our translations, we seek to do that. We, we, there are three things we value in our translations. One is the faithfulness to the meaning of the original song. Two is the melody being the same, excuse me, as much as possible. And three, it being culturally understandable, culturally relevant. So it sounds like the song could have been written in that language. When you translate with those three priorities, you often find you cannot say exactly what the song communicated, but you can get close. So, I mean, we translate songs into German and Russian and Ukrainian and Spanish and French and Italian and all kinds of languages. Um, but if you want to do that, we have a place on our website, um, sovereigngracemusic.org, uh, translations, where it says submit a translation. And I could just send you the link. And we would love to hear if you would like to submit a translation, um, we generally recommend, it's at the bottom, of the bottom of the website, we generally recommend that people do that as a team and not as an individual, because when you see, a, I'm gonna send that link right there. Um, 
an individual might be strong in one thing, but not another. In other words, they might be strong in, you know, I've got an exact translation, but it really is hard to sing. Most of our Spanish songs used to be like that. Great translation, but really hard to sing because they changed the melody. Because when you translate from English to Spanish, everything's about a third longer. Now, I don't know, you know, in your particular dialect or language that it may be similar or different. And then you, then you have to factor in the emphasis of words and how that fits with the melody. And so there are all kinds of things to consider. But if you get you know, t- two or three people to work with you, um, we, that, that the link I just sent is a place to submit translations. And we ask people to, to do it in a spreadsheet format where you have the English the translation and then the transliteration, like translate it back to English. So we can see, you know, what's happening. And we have to just depend on the native speakers, the musical native speakers to say, you know, does this really sound well in the language? But we're very excited about people translating our songs into other languages. We have lots of questions and we are almost nearing end so i'll just ask a few more um is it helpful or hurtful for church to tailor songs to unbelievers who may come into the assembly i'm sorry to tailor songs for unbelievers yeah to choose songs uh based on the unbelievers who are coming to the assembly is it helpful or maybe hurtful to choose songs in worship based on the unbeliever who's coming yeah, 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 I'll answer that in two ways. Uh, it's helpful to be aware that there are unbelievers in your service. It's unhelpful to choose songs for them. We are not building up the unbelievers in Christ. They, they aren't even in Christ. <laughs> we are building up the church in Christ. And every time the church gathers, the church needs to be built up. That, that is a command. That is an example we don't come together just to celebrate the fact that we're so good and, you know, we hope all the unbelievers get saved like we are and become just like we are. We need to be built up in Christ. And so the songs I choose are meant to do that. You know, when Ephesians 4 talks about uh, how we speak to one another, but it says we're, we've been given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Where does that happen? Well, a lot of times on Sunday morning. For the building up of the body of Christ, and then he goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 15 of Ephesians, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Um, we are seeking to build up each other. First Corinthians 12 and 14 talk about how we serve one another with our gifts and see the body of Christ built up. So no, I'm not choosing songs for unbelievers. I want to be aware of them and explain things they might not understand and maybe choose some simpler songs at times so that they would be able to get to understand them. But unless the spirit opens their eyes, they're not going to understand a simple song or, or deep song. The spirit has to do that. Mm-hmm. So seek to encourage and build up your church. And I think what you spoke about before, about the songs having the gospel in them, the unbeliever is yeah, getting the yeah. gospel through the singing of the gospel. So the singing of the yes. gospel would work that, upon their hearts as well. That serves both the people in your church and the unbelievers. Mm. Uh, another question is, what do you think about special songs during um, worship? So in India, some churches have a tradition of a special song where one person comes up and has a solo performance where they sing a song and play an instrument while everyone else watches. So what do you think yes. about that during worship? Well, we always need need to keep our aim in mind. These are great questions. And that that's when particularly helpful because it's relevant to what a lot of people are experiencing. Every culture has its pluses and minuses in in relation to what God's word tells us. So some things are good. Some things are not good. Um, So in the Indian cultural heritage, Christian cultural heritage, it might be, we do a special song. Where in the Bible does it say that you have to do a special song? Well, it doesn't, but it doesn't forbid it. 
So you have to use other parameters, other guidelines to determine whether or not this is something that's helpful. You can't say we do it because we've always been doing it. That's not a very good reason to do something. You could have been doing something that's wrong for decades. The best thing to do would be to stop it. (laughs) But a better thing to do would be to ask, how does this fit in with God's aims for our gathering? You know, if Hebrews 10 talks about how we're to encourage one another to love and good deeds, stir up one another to love and good deeds. Does this do that? Could it do that? We, we used to do some of those in our Sunday meeting. We haven't done one for a long time. Let's see nothing that prohibits it. Um, you could have someone come up and share a song that communicates, that helps the word of Christ dwell in people richly. And that could be one person singing to other Christians we're singing to one another. The Bible doesn't specify it has to all be at the same time, although that does seem to be the common practice. But it could be one person singing to the rest. But I'd say if you do it every week and it becomes more of a show and it becomes more of an evaluation of their musical skills, I would say stop doing it for a while. Unless it's serving the church and exalting the glory of Christ and, and people come away from it thinking, oh, I want to, I want to sing to the Lord more because of, you know, what I just heard. That's a good reason to do it. But if that's not the effect, you're just giving people a platform to use their gifts. I would probably think about stopping it. Uh, This is in connection to, I think we kind of touched on it before about uh, songwriting and lyrics. So how would you encourage people who want to write songs from God's word? And what are some tips or encouragements you'd give to beginners who are trying to songwrite, write songs here in India? Uh, I'm sorry, to give to who who are trying to write songs? Um, No beginners? Beginners, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, you, You first, thanks for asking that question. That's we need more songwriters. I would start a couple ways you can start. Take a passage of scripture, like a psalm, and set it to music. Just set it to music. Um, change the words as, as you need to, or just leave it as it is. You know, it's scripture in, in, in Hebrew poetry, the psalms rhyme, the songs rhyme through literary devices. We rhyme through actual rhymes, words rhyming. Their ideas rhyme, our words rhyme. But it can be helpful to say, you know, to set up, just to start playing a chord progression and sing a song. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in one. You know, just set up a chord progression and start singing the scripture over it. That'll get you going. Um, Take a hymn, an old hymn that you really love, and try to set it to different music. See what what comes up with it. Or vice versa, take an old hymn tune that you know, that you love, and put new words to it. And once you've done those things, ask some other people for their counsel. Just ask them, give me your honest opinion. What do you think of this? Um, Study songs that you think are well-crafted and seek to imitate them. There's a lot that goes into songwriting. Um, We we have some songwriting episodes on the sound plus doctrine podcast uh, there on the sovereign grace music.org site that we have a number of teachings on songwriting, but I'm just starting with the basics. Um, songwriting is mainly editing. You, you get an idea, you put it down, you think, Oh, this is great. And you have just, you're just getting started. You know, you might write a whole song and think, well, that's the song. No, you're just beginning to write a song. Now you need to turn around and ask, is that the best melody right there? Is that, are those the best lyrics right there? Is that the best way of saying that thought right there? Do I have enough of Jesus in this song? Do I say things in a way that can be misunderstood? Then you begin to ask all the questions that can turn a good song into a great song. It takes time. 
Um, but if the Lord has gifted you to do it, you'll see fruit from what you're doing. And I'd encourage you to pursue it. Thank you. I think we've run out of time and there's still rough uh, questions coming. Uh, thank you again, brother, for taking out the time and speaking to us. My pleasure. We've been encouraged. Uh, in closing, I think one of the requests would be, could you want to close us with a song? So um, maybe play a song <laughs> for us. <laughs> Oh That's one of the gosh. questions that someone asked as well. So I just put that in there. <laughs> well, here, I'll, I'll take this. Uh, uh, okay. I, I will sing, Oh Lord, My Rock, My Redeemer. That's one <laughs> that I just enjoy. A friend of mine wrote it. Um, and it was, it has been ministered to me greatly. He wrote it simply because uh, he, he wanted to, um, kind of expand on the last line of Psalm 19. Uh, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And um, this is the song that came out of it. He wrote it in a very difficult time uh, when he was battling some, some sin and uh, he just he actually sent the song to me with a different melody, totally different melody. And I said, Nate, that's a great song, but that's not the melody for it. Cause the melody wasn't as strong as the lyrics. So he sent this back to me and uh, we, I think he may have changed one or two words and, and it was done, um, which is pretty rare. But this is one of the songs that, that enables us to hear that God knows about our trials, but it also shows us that he has done something about them and that Jesus is to be uh, our greatest joy. So um, I'm sorry I don't have a microphone, but this is the Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Let me do one more thing. Sorry. Okay. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, greatest treasure of my longing soul, my God, like you there is no other. True delight is found in you alone. Your grace, a well too deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heavens reach. Your truth, a fount of perfect wisdom. My highest good and my unending need. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, strong defender of my weary heart, my sword. my shield against his hateful cause. My song when enemies surround me. My shield when tides of sorrow rise. My joy when trials are abounding. Your faithful Savior 
of my ruined life my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders in my place you suffered bled and Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. About the words in the middle. That was great. It's a great example of how Jesus perfects all our offerings. True. In closing, I would like to ask Brother Nelson to pray for us before we close in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy of learning from one another. And this evening that we've spent this time, the opportunity to consider once again, O oh Lord, the privilege to praise you, even in song. And thank you, O oh Lord, that you are working in and through us to the praise of your name and glory. We are so grateful, O oh Lord. Lord, help us that we may spur one another, yes, to love, to good works, to the praise of your name, and to the things that we've learned today, O oh Lord, apply them in our lives. Thank you for Brother Bob. Thank you for him being available to give us this time. Thank you for each one that we were able to connect. And we pray, O oh Lord, that all that we have learned, we would see that uh, spread or shared with others to the praise of your name and glory, O oh Lord. We do want to say thank you for saving us, Thank you for using us, and may your name be glorified, O Lord. Thank you for this medium that you have provided. Thank you that we can meet this way. To the praise of your name and glory always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us for this. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be a part of this. I pray for India regularly, and uh, that the gospel advance, and you are part of the answer to those prayers. Uh, that I continue to pray and uh, Jesus will be glorified Man. he will be exalted and uh, I encourage you to to spread the news of the details not to not to uh, devolve into a formalism where you're saying all the right things but it doesn't mean anything the details are really great and uh, singing is one of the ways we can express that so thank you for for letting me be with you Thank you again so much, brother. It was really encouraging.